I want to speak today on the topic the fourth dimension. If you've been coming to our church uh, for any time you probably have heard us use the word fourth dimension. You have heard a young single man pull out a list of 25 things he wants in the fourth dimension in his future wife and you might have asked the question what is fourth dimension and so um, there's a very famous book that was written by the the pastor of the largest church in the world called fourth dimension that describes about what faith is like the word fourth dimension comes from the geometry where the the one line between two points is called the first dimension the first dimension the plane is called the second dimension cube is called the third dimension and anything that's not visible to a natural eye or not limited to space time is called the fourth dimension it's like the spiritual world your thoughts is fourth dimension your motives is fourth dimension uh, your spirit is fourth dimension you know it's real but you cannot see it with your eyes you cannot see it uh, with you know with your five senses and that's what fourth dimension is not understanding the law of faith or not understanding this principle of fourth dimension limits us in three areas one is that we cannot operate in faith fully the second one is that we are limited from the miraculous in our life and thirdly is that we cannot cooperate with the Holy Spirit without understanding and embracing the law of faith which I'm going to refer today as the fourth dimension if you have your Bible let's go together with me to Matthew chapter 25 and verse 29 for to everyone who has more will be given and he will have abundance but from him who does not have even what he has will be taken away this same exact verse was mentioned in Matthew chapter 13 after Jesus explained the parable of the sower, the seed and the soil and he explained the parable, came to his disciples and said, you guys knew me or know me as the Lord and the Messiah. Now I'm giving you the secrets of the kingdom and disciples were like, well Jesus, we already know you're God. Go to the people and explain them the secrets and Jesus says this, he who has more will be given and he has a, and he will have abundance. He who doesn't have even what he thinks to have or he has physically will be taken away. Now this Bernie Sanders will not like this verse. I'm gonna jump just for once in the politics. This is brutal. Talk about helping the needy. Jesus says you don't have it, I'll take what you think to have away. You're like wow and he says if you have it more will be given to you all and on the top of that you'll get abundance. I accept in Jesus name. <laughs> we read the verse, we read the parable. I want to explain to you today about principle of faith from this verse. It's a very painful principle but it works all the time. The king gives a five talents to one guy, he gives less talents to another guy and he gave one talent to last guy. Talent is a measure of weight. It's a weight. Talent is not like a gift to sing or to perform. Talent here is it's, it's, the, it's a weight. It's like we use ounces or pounds. It's, it's a weight. So probably a certain amount of gold certain or silver or uh, precious stones but he gave them certain weight of things to one guy, second guy and the third guy. And each two guys went in, invested things. One guy came in and he buried it and he, they all came back. He rewarded them. He says, great job. And the guy who came with one thing, he didn't do anything with it. The king takes away that one talent and he does something very offensive. He gives it to the guy who has the most talents. And you're like, you only gave him one talent. That's already an insult because you don't give everyone equally and now he didn't do anything with it. You're taking that one thing away from him and you're giving to the guy with 10 talents. He already has enough. And the king said this, he said to him who has more will be given and he will have abundance. To him who doesn't have in here, inside. He said what he has in there on the outside will be taken away and he will be completely bankrupt on the outside because he's already been bankrupt on the inside. 
the big idea of this message this morning is this the state of your mind is more important than the condition of your life the state of your mind is more important than the condition in your body the state of your mind your inner world is more important than the digits in your bank account than the degrees on your wall than the family you're coming from your inner world is a magnet if you have nothing here you attract more of nothing until you get abundance of nothing if you have something here an attitude of faith an attitude of positive outlook in the middle of negative situations what happens is that you begin to have more given to you of that and then you have even more abundance so the secret is not to change my circumstances the secret is to connect with God's word and God's spirit to change the attitude and the atmosphere in my inner world in my mind can somebody shout amen, amen. Bible says our life is transformed by the renewing of our mind means our life is a result of the state of our mind that's Apostle Paul says Romans chapter 12 verse 2 it's not the other way around the Bible doesn't say your mind is changed when your life is changed it says your life is changed when your mind is changed your mind gets changed by the Holy Spirit and the Holy Scriptures can somebody say amen I didn't hear you can somebody shout amen but for many of us what's been changing our mind is our circumstances when it's our mind that's supposed to be changing the circumstances and our mind supposed to be under influence of a greater reality called the Holy Spirit and the Holy Scriptures can somebody shout amen you know there was this interesting story I heard I uh, saw a clip once of this comedian Jim Carrey where in 1985 1987 I'm sorry he was homeless he had nothing going for him and he took a blank check a blank check he had no money in his account and a blank check he wrote a check to himself for 10 million dollars and he dated 1985 19 1995 I'm sorry 1995 he wrote a check for 10 million million dollars signed it and put his name there that he's giving a check to himself he will get in 1995 a check for 10 million dollars homeless has nowhere to live has no money whatsoever somehow he gets auditioned for this movie that many of you have rewatched and quoted like the holy written scriptures dumb and dumber number one and his personality fits into that movie perfectly and it's interesting that out of that movie he receives a royalty check in 1994 so a year before his faith check was written for exactly 10 million dollars so what you have here you begin to attract more of that and then you get abundance of it and when you don't have it here the Bible says even what you have in there gets taken away if your mind is sick and your body gets healed the healing cannot last through the test of time because the, the mind that is sick cannot contain the body that is not sick the greatest problem is not with the sickness in the body it's not even with the sickness in the bones it's when sickness creeps in and begins to be sick in your mind that even when you don't have a sickness you're looking for one have you ever done it you're like something must be wrong you woke up you just didn't sleep on the right side it's, an, it's my neck that's it I need to go see a chiropractor that you just need to turn it back and forth three times and everything will be fine but when you are sick in your mind you're expecting you're worried that you're not sick because you have to be sick that's your destiny to be sick it's your calling to be sick when you are poor here you're constantly waiting for somebody to give you something taxes season 
is the Jehovah Jireh in your life because there is only one way God can bless me and that is if I get a hundred fifty dollar refund it's, it's it's the poverty here and somebody gives you a thousand dollars and you see within two weeks it's gone where it's gone why because a poor person here will always be a poor person here and there and have abundance of what is here last Sunday when a young person received a car I overheard a conversation by another wonderful person in our church and said I was really hoping I would receive the car and I said this particular person who said that has education has a good job and has money and I said I am disappointed that by now you're not dreaming to give a car you're still waiting for someone to give you one I remember when uh, two years ago me and my wife we gave our second car and and this is what I'm talking to you this has started to pain me because after we gave the car we had hundred fifty dollars in our savings and checkings combined 50 in one and hundred in the other one no money whatsoever we were not able we had no vehicles at all and that we didn't have any resources to go get a car and I am inside though I gave a vehicle I somehow believed in the law of sowing and reaping it was my twisted view of that law I, I, I was a beggar here because I expected someone to give me a car the next day and I remember two weeks passed no one gave me a car so I made phone calls I had two, two, two friends that own dealerships I called them I didn't want to say hey I don't have a car could you give me one I wanted to use a religious manipulative way because the beggar inside of me says I gave a car somebody should give me a car and nobody th those guys they offered me a, a forty-five thousand dollar Lexus and I was like sorry I gotta go something someone else is calling me it was my way of hanging up and I remember something inside of me snapped and I realized the problem wasn't with somebody giving me a car the problem is that the beggar inside of me has to go off of life support and die and I have to stop expecting why because people are not gonna supply my needs there is a God in heaven who leads my life and he will supply my needs my aim is not who will give me my aim has to be even from that point on I'm gonna give next year another car next year another car that is my aim and it's interesting when you shift inside and you stop being a beggar inside not on the outside inside something begins to shift you begin to attract the very things you are and if nobody gives you a car you'll go ahead and give yourself a car and now instead of hoping that somebody bless me me and my wife we plan and this is not to brag this is to testify that on inside something shifted we plan when we look forward the year we don't look and who who will give us something we plan strategically once a year who we gonna bless the funny part is the more we do that the more somehow miraculously things get attracted and God begins to bless us more people love to give to people who don't expect it people love to give to people who don't beg for it and we need to help the needy but you have to understand if you are the needy person be needy in your wallet not in your mind be needy in your finances not in your spirit you may literally need money for pay your utility bills that doesn't mean you shouldn't go ask you shouldn't ask for help no 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 but make sure your mind is never at the level of your circumstances your mind is on the level of the promises of God and the reality that you're a child of most high God you may have holes in your shoes but in your spirit you're full of abundance because you only attract who you are can somebody say amen I want to share with you based on this story today the, the simple how to break down the fourth dimension into our life I want you to write down point number one is don't let the third dimension trample the fourth dimension don't let the third dimension trample the fourth dimension if, if you can maybe redo them so make them on the full screen the rest of the points that would be nice don't make the third dimension trample on the fourth dimension what that means is this is that your mind should not reflect your life your life should reflect your mind 
your mind should your mind is in the fourth dimension meaning it's an invisible world and it should be affected by the supreme ruler of the invisible world the holy spirit your mind supposed to be a servant to the holy spirit not a slave to your reality your mind is not supposed to be running errands of disease sickness and poverty your mind is supposed to be a faithful disciple to the holy spirit say holy spirit you are my prince see what happens is when our mind is not a disciple of the holy spirit it becomes a slave of cancer of tumor arthritis abuse hurt loneliness negative words people circumstances it becomes trampled and whoever is not lazy tramples on our mind that's why jesus says when a sower went out to sow the only the only soil where the birds stole the seed was a sidewalk you know what the sidewalk is it's when everyone walks over you when you have a mind that your abuse, your past, your circumstances, your finances, your husband, your feelings walk over you, anything gets thrown by the Holy Spirit in your direction. It doesn't even land on you. The devil just takes it, takes it, takes it because your mind is a sidewalk. It's supposed to be a disciple of the Holy Spirit, not a sidewalk for everything from your past, your abuse, your feelings or your circumstances. Your mind is a disciple, not a sidewalk. Somebody say amen. When your mind is a sidewalk you blame other people like this man he said the reason why i hid my talent is because you master you're terrible you're angry you steal and so it gives me a right not to be my best because you're not your best people with the sidewalk mindsets are the people who say the reason why i am angry because my wife is crazy the reason why i'm lonely is because nobody loves me the reason why I believe what I believe now is because I've been abused. What you're saying is that your mind is a reflection of your circumstances. And you're always blaming other people. I am poor because I've never been going to school. I don't have the proper documents. I don't have the proper connections. Someone always gets ahead of me. I've never preferred. People always hate me. Everybody hates me. And that's why I am that I am. You're a slave to your reality because you're not a disciple to the Holy Spirit your mind will either be a disciple or a slave it's like the guy the uh, older gentleman who had a mustache and his children came and they put they put a special cheese on his mustache it smells he woke up from the couch he says Phew, the couch smells he goes into the living room realizes the, the living room smells goes into the kitchen the kitchen smells he went to the bathroom the bathroom smells he says man I need to get out of this smelly house he goes into the outside and he says the whole world smells and that's how many of us our husband smells our children smell our boss smells the church smells the pastor smells everybody smells and it's maybe it's you who smell maybe it's here stinking thinking that smells they need to be washed off by the precious blood of Jesus Christ can somebody shout amen when it's everyone's problem it's probably your problem and it's not your problem it's the mind problem that needs to be renewed by the word of God and the Holy Spirit can somebody say amen don't let life trample you the Bible tells me Jesus gives me power to trample me to trample the Bible never gave power to your life to trample you it gave you power to trample it many of us were like the sidewalk we're being trampled day and night i want you today to restore your holy dignity your identity in christ jesus to tell you this fourth dimension is this is when your third dimension third dimension is what you see what you feel what's going on around you you have to divorce you have to tell that dimension you are no longer gonna change me i'm gonna change you because I am connected to the Holy Spirit and you're connected to me. Amen. Point number two. We move from point of defeat to the position of victory. The Bible says this man says verse 25 and I was afraid and I went and hid your talent in the ground. He had a point of defeat fear and out of this point he started to make decisions he started to act 
see what every time what you do it's not what we do that matters as much as what are we doing it from am I doing it from the position of victory or am I doing it from the point of defeat he said I was afraid I was in panic I was desperate I was lonely I was abused I was rejected and therefore I reacted toward that see many of us make decisions in a swamp our feet are wobbly the Bible says he takes us God takes us from the miry clay he takes us from the swamp and puts our feet on a rock listen your life might be in the swamp but your feet has to be on the rock you have to be stable your decisions your prayer your fasting has to come from a position of I know who I am I am on a rock I am not in a swamp I'm not gonna drain the swamp I'm not gonna pray for the swamp I'm gonna move from swamp to the rock see right now we are praying for souls I found myself when we started to do uh, more focus on Sunday service and we don't see as many people coming to the front for salvation on Sunday as on Wednesday we start to fast like we're gonna fast tomorrow day after and Wednesday and I found myself a few months ago praying out of desperation saying God nobody getting saved God this is bad God this is hard and you know when you start going that prayer it's kind of an like old Pentecostal like the dirtier I am the more victim you make yourself to be before God somehow like you're gonna squeeze the father's hand and God's gonna say oh since you're so broke busted disgusting here we go and then you leave that kind of prayer you're like man I felt so much better before I prayed and I wonder if I stop praying and I will feel better because prayer is literally like a vacuum sucking everything out of me and I don't want this and on the top of that I fasted if I wouldn't if I would have eaten and not prayed would have felt great and I remember the Holy Spirit started to convict me he said Vlad you have to stop fasting and praying out of the position of defeat it's not desperation that moves God it's the revelation it's the faith that moves God pray out of the position of the vision you have of people coming to the salvation not out of the need that nobody's coming to salvation it's a point and a, po and a position one is a point of defeat one is a point nothing happened last Sunday the other one is a position of the future something is going to happen next Sunday see you can fast it's not the fasting the Bible says the righteous the, the foolish and the wise men both built great houses one had a rock the other one had a swamp we all gonna fast I'm gonna challenge you this fasting is gonna be building a house but first of all I want you to build your mindset you're not fasting out of a need you're fasting out of a vision a dream a faith that you have for your future with God Does somebody say amen you're not giving out of desperation desperation may be a point to trigger something but desperation is not what's going to keep you what's going to keep you is a confident revelation that God is on my side I am a victor broke like a joke but that's only in my wallet in my mind I am blessed with Abraham in my mind the Lord is my shepherd he's the El Shaddai he is the Adonai he is my God in my mind I am healed in Christ in my body I am still sick I'm going to the doctor tomorrow but that's my body my mind is linked with the Holy Ghost hallelujah and somebody say amen and somebody say hallelujah somebody say move so get the swamp out of your life my feet are on the rock it means be stable in your prayer many of us we instead of feeling our focus is feeling better instead of thinking better that's why drugs are very popular our generation is a feeler generation Bible calls you a believer not a feeler you have feelings but feelings is not who you are faith is who you are Bible says we belong to the household of faith we have the word of faith we have the spirit of faith we have the gift of faith to live a life of faith feeling is a luxury but feeling is not where my feet are resting on if your feeling if your feet are resting on your feelings you will not last through just a few weeks of Christian life 
your marriage will not last finances will not last rest your feet on the promises of God can somebody say amen and number three is we fill our mind with right information we fill our mind with right information this man said in the verse 20 24 Lord I knew you I knew you to be a hard man see not only we know that he was blaming others for the lack of his success not only we know that he made decisions out of fear instead of a faith but now he tends to be Mr. Know-it-all he knows everything he says you know why I'm afraid because I knew something I know you really I realized in a very short life that I've lived um, we don't see things the way they are we see things the way we are a lonely person will always think everyone is not liking them every place they go a friendly person will walk into the most hostile room and always find friends a poor person will look at every opportunity and think somebody's out to get them somebody's always out to punish them a person it's, it's always you always are looking through the lenses of your self-esteem through the lenses of your own faith he says I knew you other guys knew the master differently what you fill your mind with is information that is used by the Holy Spirit to cook up a revelation a revelation it becomes I know revelation becomes I'm convinced revelation is it's a stronghold revelation is that you don't even choose to think like that it thinks for you already it's automatic response that's a revelation and the revelation always brings a manifestation it means brings a change in your life the problem is the mindset but mindsets are formed by the overflow of what the mind is filled with so what we need to do is this we must understand we cannot change our mindset we can only change what we fill our mind with and the Holy Spirit will take out of that bucket and begin to pour into the bucket of our mindset because it's the work of the Holy Spirit and then he creates I know he says I knew you're angry Job said I know my Redeemer lives Paul said I know whom I believed in chains beaten shipwrecked drowned he says I know he holds everything in his hand and he says he will bring me up at the last day what do you know what do you know what do you know whatever you fill your mind with will soon becomes your stronghold information leads to revelation revelation becomes your manifestation watch what you fill your mind with be protective of what goes into your mind on purpose fill your mind with information that you want to be in the future as a reality of your life don't be an emotional wreck don't be an emotional drama where the only thing you need is just to feel good the Bible doesn't say man lives by the amount of music he listens to it says by the amount of the Word of God he feeds himself with you got to fill yourself with information can somebody say amen you cannot control how you feel but you can control what you feed yourself with faith is not how we feel faith is how we think and how we think is affected by the information we put into our mind and the last point is align your confession align your confession this man said I knew this and this I thought we we're talking about feeling information not the music <laughs> align your confession and this simply means is that make sure your confession helps you to be where you're planning to go instead of being contradictory the prodigal son was in the bit in the midst of the pig's pen and then he said this to himself he says i will go to my father's house i will say this and this he's still sitting in the pig pen he's still sitting in his mess but his own mouth listen to this is paving a way for his feet your confession will create a path for your feet your confession will either describe your situation ah my wife is crazy ah just my kids are just just nuts the devil's children ah my finances there's just I am so poor ah, I just never have enough I just need to work extra while because we don't have enough what you just did is you released a path for more poverty 
Your finances are right here. But remember where they're going. Well, your confession just paved the path for them. And guess what happened to the prodigal son? His feet went into the very place where just minutes ago his mouth went already. And he didn't even finish his, his repentance when the father already blessed him with more. You will always get more what you confess. But confession paves the way for your feet to walk. You may say, but well, you, you know, my reality, my reality is, remember we said, our mind is not a slave to our reality. Our mind is a disciple of the Holy Spirit. And therefore you choose to confess. You look at your wonderful husband or your wonderful wife and you say, you're the best thing that had happened to me. You're like, what if I don't believe it? You will. Your feet will catch up to your mouth. But if you keep walking around and saying, you stupid thing, you crazy thing, you never, you always, you. Remember one thing, even if you believe in your heart they're the best thing, your feet just went twisted. You cursed your spouse. You cursed your children. You may say, they are already cursed. Well, this is not going to help with your confession. Your confession has to help to change the situation by the word of God. Do not let your mouth betray your inner reality. Your mouth can help to change that inner reality by the word of God. God said if you're poor, God didn't say walk around and say I'm broke. God says say I'm blessed. God says if you're weak, don't walk around and say I'm so weak, I'm so old, I'm so, I'm so hard. He says I'm strong. Say what you want to see, not what you feel. Otherwise you put a lock on your circumstances and then you can pray till you lose your pulse. Nothing's gonna shift. What you have, you will always get more and abundance. What you don't have, you will get even that which you think to have taken away from you. You may say, well my circumstances are tough. Be tougher. <laughs> you say, but, but this sickness is stubborn. Well tell your sickness, you stubborn, I am stubborn too. You're not the only one that's stubborn. Like Robert Schuller used to say, tough times don't last, tough people do. Be tough. You may say, but, but what if nothing changes? What if I walk around believing my spouse will get saved, my children will save, and nothing will change? What if I walk around and believe that I am healed by the stripes of Jesus, I still know that I have a sickness and my sickness will never leave. Now look at the other side. You're gonna die. You're not gonna have a sickness no more. The sickness on this earth, the Bible says at the end of the days, God's gonna roll up the earth like carpet and burn it. So no matter what, your sickness is gonna leave. So you gotta mentally tell the devil and tell yourself, you're leaving. If the devil says, not now, you're like, you will still. I will be without sickness for eternity and you gonna burn. Either now or later, but you will burn. You're a winner. You're not a loser. Can somebody say amen? Now, I want to correct something in the end. We are not trying to teach people to ignore the presence of their problem. We're not telling you to ignore the presence of your affliction. We're just encouraging you to reject its rule over your life. You can be sick in the body, not in the mind. Sick in here or poor in here, but not in here. You're not rejecting its presence. Faith is not being saying it doesn't exist. Faith is saying it exists. But it's not going to rule me because I am ruled. My Lord is not tumor. My Lord's name is Yahweh. My Lord is not bankruptcy. My Lord's name is Jesus. My Lord's name is not loneliness. My Lord's name is Yahweh. The Lord is one. Can somebody say amen? Do you receive something this morning church?